All right. We start now. The Saber and the Sage, Saladin and Maimonides. So when we last left our heroes in Jerusalem, we, we had done a deep dive on the Crusades, the, essentially the Christian period and the, the Christian Crusader kingdom. And essentially, until Salad, Saladin comes, the Christians have established a number of, of cities and even a bit of a kingdom. A, Jerusalem is its own uh, country, if you will, uh, that has a, a set of kings. And um, Saladin will begin to consolidate power um, in the Levant, in this area that you see on the map, between 1174 and uh, 1193. Who is Saladin? Saladin is educated in Syria. He has a very diverse curriculum. The, the, um, the Muslim cultures of the time were probably some of the most advanced in terms of their, uh, their various types of education. Um, in fact, Rambam, who we know is contemporary with him, will, will study and learn Aristotelian knowledge in Alexandria at this time. So it's not surprising that Saladin got a very diverse education, math, philosophy, Islam, amongst other su subjects. And he rises to power both as a skillful commander, a politician, and an administrator. And he manage to, manages to take advantage of a crumbling Fatimid empire and me methodically gains control over the entire Red Sea area. And when his father, Nur ad-Din, and patron passes away, he takes over Damascus, his, um, his Saladin's um, uh, skill is well known, he's uh, well thought of, and he easily um, consolidates power in this entire green area that you see. Now, in Jerusalem, the, um, Jerusalem is headed by King Ham Amarek of Jerusalem, and he wants to also take advantage of the Fatimid uh, Empire, and he wants to... Um, take also advantage of the instability of the Zengid dynasty, but unfortunately in his campaigns he dies of dysentery in 1174. And then comes a series of fairly well-known kings, and they're well-known for their sort of exceptional scenarios. Uh, Baldwin IV is the famous leper king of Jerusalem, and Baldwin IV um, um, dies, of course, of his leprosy, and Give, gives way to Baldwin V, the, uh, the child king. And um, Baldwin knows that he has to make a truce with Saladin, and the two form a truce, which part of the truce, it forbids the Christians from raiding Muslim caravans. But there are, there are two, um, there are different nobles in the area, and one of them, Reynold of Ch Chatillon, uh, violates the truth, he attacks a caravan, retreats to his castle, and he refuses even to answer the emissary that has been sent by, by Saladin or to, by the, the Muslims to, to answer for his crimes. And this fuels a jihad, a holy war, that is launched by Saladin. And who, he marches on the crusader states, and he very easily takes Tiberia. Now, having Tiberia means that you have water and that is extremely important and so with Saladin having taken um, having taken Tiberia and the jihad being initiated the Christians have no choice they have to go out and they have to confront um, Saladin on the field of battle and what do you do back then when you want to have a, a really good um, success in battle, you take out your holiest relic. What's the holiest relic? The true cross. So they take the true, true cross out of Jerusalem and, and they march to meet Saladin. And this is the famous battle of the Horns of Hatton. So just so you know what the Horns of Hatton are, these two horns, over, which overlook the Sea of Galilee right there, that's the horns of Hatton. And these two, at that time, were believed to have pools of water in them. And this is the, essentially the field in which the battle culminates. So the truth of the matter is the battle is won well before it gets to this place. Uh, and I'll just show you, the battle is a very classic Israeli geography. I remember when I toured the north, 
our tour guide sort of stopped us there and sort of told us the story. I'm not sure he told it exactly accurately. Uh, the way that our tour guide told the story back then was that Saladin just waited for these these Christian knights who were sweating in, in this heavy armor, and he wasn't wearing armor, and so they, they plotzed out of, you know, Chomayom, the schwitzing in the heat. That's not exactly how the whole thing happened, um, because the Christians had been there for quite some time. They knew how hot it, got, it gets, and so they... They miscalculated, but it wasn't because they brought the wrong clothes entirely. Now, they start out at um, Tsipori, or Sephoria, which you can still go to today, and I assure you in the summer it is quite hot in Tsipori. But Tsipori has an ancient water system there, enough to feed the troops, and so they start out with enough, with enough water. But what happens is, as they're marching through, through this, uh, this valley, as they march across to meet Saladin, who is, again, outside Tiberia, they have three columns of, of Christian forces, and they're just moving very, very slowly. And they have to camp in the middle, and they don't have enough water. So their water supply really runs out, and that's what, what happens here. Um, uh, I'm sort of, let me just check the time here. Um, I don't want to run out of time, but if you want, you can you can see there is a, a very nice uh, uh, video on this. Um, um, it it is um, the well. I'm tempted to show it to you, but I'll, I'll maybe if we have time at the end, I can show you the dramatization of this um, of this particular battle at the horns of Hattin. But the, I, the I'd vote to see it. What's that? I'd vote to see the video. It looked interesting. Yeah, trust me, Des. I only have until Mincha, which is 40 minutes. I have some yeah, mic droppers here, which um, you won't get on any video that I know of. So if we have time, we'll get the video at the end. It's, it's, it's a really Hollywood version of what happened. What you need to know is that Saladin is very smart. He knows that the great Christian strength is that you can't meet them head on. They're, they're a cavalry. But what he essentially does is he lights fires, he smokes them out, he forces them to... to to stay away from any water source, and essentially, they're 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 by the time the the he allows his archers to menace them from the sides, and by the time they actually meet Saladin, they are so parched with thirst they're essentially begging for water they can't even lift a sword. Um, and so that's the that is the battle of of uh, of the horns of Hatin, and that is the end of essentially the end of the Christian rule the christian crusader state it now returns Jerusalem returns to muslim rule and saladin has a very interesting reputation in the in the christian world they think of him as a true knight merciful and gracious uh, the story goes that that the uh, the noble who had committed the offense who originally raided on the muslim tribes he and the king of jerusalem appear before saladin and saladin gives water to the king. And he says, I won't give water to your friend. You can give water to him, but the moment I give him water, he becomes my guest and I can't harm him. And Saladin is too gracious. He knows the rules and he acts as a true gentleman and true knight. Um, and the poet Lessing puts these interesting words in Saladin's mouth, right? Which he says, I never demanded that all the trees should have one bark. Meaning there was a certain measure of live and let live Amongst the, amongst the, um, the Jews and the Christians, Saladin essentially allowed them to be, to be themselves. This is both true and not true. The Saladin was f uh, following the very famous Pact of Omar. There's an agreement that the one of the original caliphs Omar made, which is that Jews and Christians were called dimis. They're peoples of the book. They believe in monotheism, but they're not fully Muslim. And there are certain laws that get variously enforced. Saladin actually enforces them more rigorously than previous Muslim rulers. In fact, the Fatimids, the previous Muslim dynasties, used the Jews to, to keep power and they keep other Muslim dynasties in check. But Saladin reversed the type of tolerance and forbade Jews and Christians to ride on horses. They could only ride on donkeys with pack saddles. And there are recorded instances of Muslims acting as vigilantes against Jews 
who were riding, you know, an unsanctioned beast. Maybe they were on a, on a, a mule, maybe they were on a, a horse, and th there are Jews who get pelted with stones. The, the evidence that Saladin was extremely tolerant is not great. In other words, there's a lot of evidence that Saladin was less tolerant of the Jews. But what became so fascinating to me in this whole picture, I wanted to know about how did Saladin treat the Jews. But what I discovered is that there is a relationship between these two men. Unquestionably, there is a strong relationship between these two men. The question is how strong. So on your right, hopefully, um, is a famous picture of the Rambam, which I can tell you is not actually the Rambam. Anybody want to tell me why that's not the Rambam? He's got no payas. Right? You're not allowed to shave over here. You're not allowed to shave in, in this area right, uh, right here. But this is the picture everybody you oh, know, yeah. throws around for the Rambam. So we're just going to use that for Rambam right now. And this is a picture probably is not Saladin, but again, we're going to work with it. Now, first of all, this is, everybody agrees to the following. The Rambam's wife, who, who as best as I could tell from the sources I could get my hands on, um, you know, as I was traveling, his wife, who was known as Bat Mishael, she has a, a brother, Abu Lama'ali Uziel. This man is, without question, Sal Saladin's doctor. Okay, so that means the Rambam's brother-in-law was for sure Saladin's doctor. That seems to be the agreement. However, there are a number of sources that say that Rambam himself was the doctor of Saladin. So, uh, Rabbi Sadia ibn Danan, who dies in 1493, so he lives a couple of centuries after the Rambam, he says, in Egypt, Rambam grew great in Torah and wisdom and rose with the king. Salah al-Din ibn Iyov, right? So that's Saladin. That's Hebrew for Saladin. Meaning he says that Rambam was Saladin's doctor. Vimishnehu shofet shoftim el-Fatzel. So the vizier el-Fatzel, for sure Rambam was his doctor. Again, there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of evidence that Rambam was the doctor to the vizier. It is, there is also some evidence that Rambam was the doctor to Saladin. Another, um, one of these biographies of notable physicians, this one written by a Muslim, Ibn Abu Usi, Usi, Us, I can't pronounce these guys, Osabia, right? So bi biography of notable physicians, right? He says Maimonides was the f physician of Saladin. Now, other evidence that we have, Rambam in his letter to Ibn Tibbin in 1199 claims to have been a physician to members of the royal family. And that I think there's, there's good evidence for that maybe some of Saladin's wives, his children, Rambam was the physician to them. Maimonides was a protege of Saladin's minister, Al-Qadi, al Al-Fadil. The TV is on. And... So, oh, hold on, I want to go back a slide. And in a letter supposedly written in October 1191, Maimonides tells his friend that he had won a great name as a physician and was consulted by the chief dignitaries of the state. It's hard to know what chief dignitaries of the state means. Does that mean that he was, a, uh, he was to Saladin or not? Now, all of this comes with, on the other hand. On the other hand, and this is a very important thing. Um, Raimonides has a list of, um, in his medical writings, he, there's a treatise that is written for his son and successor, Al-Malik Al-Afal, and another for his nephew, um, Takin uh, Din Umar. And in, in that important treatise, which is sort of his, like, you know, uh, his final advice, he would have mentioned that he had served Saladin. But there is nothing there. And so, Perhaps that's the strongest evidence that Rambam was not. But what, what you can appreciate now is that the Rambam, who is without question one of the, if not the most important uh, um, Jewish thinker of, of the medieval period, certainly you know, he has an outsized footprint amongst 
maybe the only other person who stands with Rambam in, the, in his impact on Jewish learning is Rashi. And so Rambam literally is, is enmeshed with the royal family of this, this also, this in, enormous figure, this uniter of empires of Saladin. I want to take you back, though, a few decades before Saladin, because you're, it's important to understand where the Jewish community was before that. And we're going to, our, our shepherd for this journey is going to be none other than the Rambam. So the story you have to understand is the Almohads. The Almohads were a group of Muslims, generally speaking, Muslims did not practice the, the religious coercion uh, scenario of convert or die. That's a general rule. The exception is the Almohades. The Almohades were a, a sect of, of, of Islam, and the founder was Abdullah ibn uh, Turmat. And he was a, a, a follower of, of a Muslim f- um, philosopher, and he understood that the Islam and the Quran are dedicated around the sword. And he was he was anxious. He was one of these. It was like a Savonarola of the Muslim world. He combated luxury in living and dress. He was against poetry, music, art. A very fun guy, right? He stressed the superiority of Islam, and he pro- he promulgated a Unitarian confession of faith. Um, and he essentially brought things to the, to the sword. So, um, just want to read you a quote of his. So he says, your ancestors have not accepted Muhammad as the true prophet on the ground that your Messiah will appear 500 years after the Hegira. Hegira is sort of the, the Muslim, um, timeline based on, on, the time of Muhammad, right? The advent of Muhammad. The 500 years have now elapsed and your Messiah has not appeared. Consequently, unless you will accept Muhammad as your prophet, now we shall regard you as heretics and outcasts forbidden to dwell in our land. Should you decide to remain here, you have only one of two choices, either embrace Islam or death, right? So that's Islam or the sword. So Maimonides, the Almohad's first find Maimonides in Cordoba. And then he moves from Cordoba to, to Fez, Morocco. But then the, the Almohades take hold in Morocco. And there's actually a very interesting story. It's probably not a true story. But there's a story that is written in one of the histories of, of the Rambam that talks about the, the fact that the Rambam walked out one day carrying his lulav. And as was the custom of Anshe Yerushalayim, it was the Hasidim, the pious ones, would walk around with their lulav all day during Sukkot. So this Sukkot, one of the, uh, the kings sees the Rambam carrying his lulav. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, this is, he, the king says, this is a stupid practice. It's superstition. The Rambam says, this is not superstition. This is an ancient practice of the Jewish people that was revealed by God. It is part of the Torah. If you want to know about folly, folly is casting stones. And the, um, this casting of stones may have been a reference to something that Muslims do on the Hajj, which is called the ritual of stoning the devil, which apparently goes back to Avraham on his journey who stoned the devil, um, which may be related to a Midrash about Avraham and the devil on his way to the Akeda. But the, 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 in Part of the Hajj is this ritual of stoning the devil. The advisors of the king then stir up resentment against Rambam. And then Rambam has to flee Morocco. The story is unlikely to be terribly true. It doesn't have the ring of truth to it. But what it does tell us is that at a certain point, Rambam felt comfortable walking around in public holding his lulav, like any good Jew in Borough Park or Hendon or Golders Green or... uh, um, where do I want to, or um, not Vaughn, what do they call it? Uh, um, um, what's the north part of Bathurst and Lawrence. Bathurst and Bathurst Lawrence. And Lawrence. 
Bar- Winnipeg Oaken in the old 19. days, right? So it was like it was like any of those places where a Jew Oaken could feel 19. like a Jew, right? And then overnight, they see this as an act of heresy. And so the, what we do know is that the Rambam had to sneak out. He hides during the day, and he then goes to to Cueta, Ciuta. I wanted to ask Joseph Marciano if he knew this place. It looks very beautiful. It's Ciuta, uh, and it is beautiful. It's Ciuta, and it is beautiful. Yeah. Okay. You can see this is the port of Ciuta. He boards a ship here, and he travels to... Ultimately, he makes his way to Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, you forgive this; it's just my poor ability to animate. There is no evidence that he stopped in Italy. Um, he didn't go to Sicily. That's just a that's just a, an artifact of my poor drawing. He takes a Mediterranean route that we do know, and uh, he ends up in Alexandria in Egypt. And in Alexandria, that is where he really we we saw just earlier about that's his rise to power. That's where he comes into contact with the family of of uh, of Saladin. Just for pure bio- biographical purposes, he starts in Alexandria, but then he he um, moves to Fustat, which is sort of the old city of Cairo, the ancient city of Cairo. Um, now, here's something else to appreciate. Again. Remember that the Almohade's standard operating procedure was convert or die. So there is a story in um, the, in one of the Muslim um, histories that talks about Maimonides having been accused of embracing Islam and then renouncing it. That would be a really big problem, right? Because if you embrace Islam and then renounce it, then that's like a form of heresy. The reason this is so important is that the Rambam writes an incredibly important and to a certain extent rather surprising treatise called the Igeret Hashmad, the treatise, or the letter on persecution. And this letter on persecution, originally lit, written in the year 1160, um, is the first of Rambam's written works. And this particular um, treatise is fascinating because essentially the Rambam writes this in response to another rabbi who had said that those people who accept Islam, accept, converting to Islam is actually much easier than any other religion. You basically, you make this um, um, declaration, this, more or less you accept Allah as God and Muhammad as his prophet. That's more or less the declaration. And then you're, you're a Muslim. And the, the question is, if a Jew were to do that, is the, is the Jew in a scenario of an unrepentable sin? So this Chacham Echad, this one rabbi, basically says this is, is an unforgivable sin. And the Rambam is very aware of these pressures. He's aware of what's happening. And generally speaking, if you read the Talmud, there are three sins where Yehareg Yavor. You should allow yourself to be killed and, and not transgress. One of them is betraying your faith. And... So, for example, the classic example would be if you were told that you have to bow down to Baal Peor, you have to worship Baal Peor, you have to worship this, this uh, uh, essentially ancient Canaanite cult, and or be killed, you have to take the sword. So this is what Rambam writes. He said, should one, however, inquire of me, shall I be slain or, announce the, or pronounce the Maimonidean confession? My answer would be, utter the formula and live. To be sure, one should not continue to live in such environment, but until the opportunity presents itself to leave, one should be confined to the privacy of his home and conduct his transactions in secret. In other words, put on your talis and tefillin, say your Shema, but when you go outside, you, uh, you, you do what Muslims do outside your house and inside your house. Um, you practice your Judaism. For this kind of apostasy directed exclusively at compelling verbal confession is unique. A rabbi's contention of better suffer death than to commit transgression was never to imply a single transgression without action. Their reference is only to transgression in action which involves positive precepts and prohibitions. In other words, if you have to bow down to the idol, you have to pour a libation to the idol. So those are the problems. But you just have to say words. Words that have no meaning? Who really believes in that anyway? 
That's not a big deal. Um, and then Ramam continues. I took a couple of selections to this. The fifth category deals with how one should regard himself during the days of apostasy. It is imperative. Uh, Rabbi, one... What's that? Can I ask a quick sure. question, if I may? So, to me, it sounds like it's just a question of degree. You know, he's saying, do what the do what the Arabs do outside of your house. Inside your house, you're putting the tzitzit into tefillin. So outside of the house, if the Muslims are bowing down to whoever they're bowing down to, and uh, I mean, where, where does one draw the line between his so, argument and... You know, think about I this think in contrast Islam to the story a... of Rabbi Amnon, right? You know the story of Rabbi Amnon and, and you know, he was asked to accept Christ, right? And the, the Ashkenazic version of this is very different. Now, there are differences between Christianity and Islam, and and, and we could we could speak a lot about the nuances of, of, of it and whether baptism is this or that, but but the point that the Rama makes and and there is there is significant Rabbi Dr. Chaim Soloveitchik says that the Rambam was maybe more polemic than halacha. There are others who say no, the Rambam is being very legalistic about how he's approaching this. But the Rambam is is this is a I think there is a certain amount of there are two things to understand. One is I do think that there is some real shock value. I think that your average yeshiva student, when con- confronted with this question, would say, you can't say that. You have to take the sword. Rambam is saying, no, no, no. I'm not going to give them that. I am going to tell them to live. What they have to learn to do is be in secret until they can get out. And he speaks vociferously in this particular slide. You can see he talks about the fact that you should... Um, um, you should make your way out, right? Is an imperative one that um, um, that performing even one of the mitzvahs in this state of pseudo apostasy, God will double His reward, inasmuch as He did not do it for self glory or out of fear, but for the sake of God. In other words, you put on your tefillin in your house, double reward for you. And there is no comparison between the reward bestowed upon Him for performing a mitzvah without fear and one who exposes himself to the danger of loss of life and possession. Indeed, it's such occasion that God said to us to search him with all your heart and all your soul, right? This is the Shema. Nevertheless, we must do everything in our power to continually keep in mind to leave these regions which incurred God's wrath. God's wrath. Um, so we, we, the Rambam's um, articulations in this letter are very much articulations that that are meant to support the Jewish community, and they may have been autobiographical. We, we saw that the Rambam will leave the Almohades twice. He will leave once from from Cordoba, and a second time from Morocco, as the the Almohades take place there. All right, fifteen minutes left. Let's see if we can get to the next stage now. The what we're going to find out is that there is going to be another letter that the Rambam is going to have to write. There are actually several of them. I'm only going to be able to do, deal with two of them. The another letter comes with trouble in Yemen, and this begins with the oh. prince um, Abdanabi bin Ali Madi, who belonged to the sect of Karajites, who are again a very sort of violent sect of fanatical sect of Islam. And um, his in, his religious intelligence drove Jews to either despair, conversion, or to embrace false me- messianism. And here Saladin comes back into the picture. Saladin, through his brother, conquers Yemen in 1174, and a religious tolerance is restored. So Saladin represents a bit of a balance to this picture. And so you're, you, you have this fanatical Muslim sort of sub-caliphate, which pushes the Rambam all over. It pushes him to write this letter on on apostasy and to develop um, and to develop the this position that reminds Jews that if you if you had to do that to save your neck, you're still Jewish, but you need to get out of there. Now, there is a messianic element that is all sort of brewing. You can see this is my graph of messianic fervor versus the date. 
So right now we're at 1172, but the year 1240 is an interesting date because the year 1240 is 5,000 in the Jewish calendar. And 5,000 in the Jewish calendar is like the end of the fifth millennia. There's sort of this feeling that Mashiach must come by 5,000. Why hasn't he been here already? The second piece is you have Saladin versus the Crusader kingdom. The Jews knew that this, you know, the, the intolerant Christians were soon to confront their, their, uh, their din v'cheshbon, their, their um, uh, I guess, their divine justice. And this combination of messianism, even though Rambam significantly tempers messianism, he tells people that you, are, you cannot calculate the date of Mashiach. But there are some historians who say, and I think this is fascinating, the first, there's, before Maimonides, there's really not any code of Jewish law. The closest thing you have is a code that was written by the, in the days of the Gaonim, which is called the Bahag, the Bal Halachot Gedolot. Jews love studying Talmud, and anybody who just came from Rabbi Federgren's class knows that you don't get to conclusions quickly in the Talmud. And the Baal Halachot Gedolot was an attempt to give you a little bit of clarity about how does the law actually distill itself. But until Rambam, nobody wrote a code. Maimonides writes his magnum opus in exactly this time, the Mishnah Torah. The Mishnah Torah is a very, very organized, poorly footnoted, in fact, not footnoted at all, a very organized, what they call an apodictic compendium of Jewish law. It is a very, very digested, this is the laws of Truma, this is the laws of Maaser, these are the laws of all these different things. The suggestion is that the Rambam thought the Mashiach was coming, although he did not want to trumpet that, but should Mashiach come and there needs to be a Jewish state, the Rambam wanted to be prepared with a constitution and a civil code that would govern all areas of Jewish life, and that is the inspiration to write the very first code of Jewish law. Des, that's my first mic drop tonight. And to me, that is better than any, anything you can get on YouTube on, uh, on the, the horns of Hatton. Now, now, how much time do I have? i got to be in shul in 10 minutes. All right, let's try and do the Egeret Teman in five minutes. See if this works. The Egeret Teman, the letter to Yemen. So as I mentioned a few slides ago, there is this messianic fervor that is taking place in Yemen. And the Rambam is writing in response to that. He's writing this work, which is called the Egeret Teman, likely composed around the year 1172. It is written in Judeo-Arabic so that everyone could understand it. Now, this work is a very important work. Um, I, 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 one part of my research to, brought me to, to um, Professor David Golan. And Professor David Golan has a very interesting perspective on Messianism. He says, Messianism is simultaneously the most important precept of Judaism and the most dangerous. Why is it the most important? It says because without Messianism, Jews would not have had the hope to carry on all these years. He says, Zionism parachuted directly out of the airplane of Messianism. It doesn't matter that Herzl and Ben-Gurion didn't believe in God. If you don't have messianism, if you don't have Lashon HaBab Yerushalayim, if you don't have that the idea that God will redeem His people again, you're not you're not keeping up this fight for two thousand years. Messianism is absolutely essential to the picture, and so you have to gently balance this idea of of messianism. And so the Rambam is writing this letter, the Igeret Teman. Um, this letter to um, to help people balance so that they understand where to put this idea. And David Golan, Professor David Golan says something very interesting. He says, the Rambam will employ the concept of Chevle Mashiach. Chevle Mashiach are the birth pangs of Messiah. The birth pangs of Messiah. Those are That's a fantastic thing to work with. Right. If the idea is that the, the Jews have um, have have suffered, we suffer for a reason. It is not pointless suffering. The Rambam will pick this up, and here, in this in these words, I'm, I'll just translate the slide for you. Um, it says, "V'davar lo herbo bal emuna." Of all of this, a person of faith should not worry. V'lo 
Yashlichuhu Misha Yeshlo Bemosha Emuna. Don't throw away your Judaism, those who, who have faith in Moses. Just know these travails that took place in Yemen. They're the birth pangs of Messiah. The, the rabbis prayed that, that um, for, from God that God would not um, make, let them falter in all of this. And the, the, also the, the prophets had this idea. And just to skip forward a little bit, he says, he quotes this this very obscure idea. It says, This is a these words misumo el are words that come out of Bilam's mouth. Bilam the non Jewish prophet. And Bilam essentially says, Everything that takes place, it's God's will. You need to understand that everything is God's will. But what is really fascinating is that this word, this is God's will, these are oblique references to Jesus and Muhammad. If you look in the Yalku Shimoni, if you look at some of various Midrashim, you will see that the Midrashim that were in the hands of the Rambam at that time said, understood this Pasuk to mean Nidrash Pasuk Ze Al Yishmael Ki Ilu Haya Katuv Mi Yichye Mi Yishmael Meaning Christianity, Islam, these are things that God has sent to test you. Right? And that it will be Rambam's general theme. His general theme is that many people will go astray. The Rambam is going to tell us that, that in the days of Daniel, he says, some of our brethren became confused and their hearts f- faltered and new doubt arose in them. Their logic faltered. Some did not... Uh, did not stray from their faith. There were some who, who remained true. This happens in the days of, of Daniel of blessed memory. When the days of exile run long and the travails weigh upon us, many leave the faith and they are filled with doubt and error. But, Vatem Achenu, you, my brothers, Hanichem Yodim Shebimei Nebuchadnezzar Harasha, Hichrichot Yisrael Avod Avodazarad, that Nebuchadnezzar, the conqueror of Jerusalem, forced their ancestors to to uh, worship, idol worship. The only people who su- survived were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Most of the Jews disappeared. And then he's going to say, also in the days of Hanukkah, same problem. Again, you had very, but these are, this is God's will. God gives you a test. And there are going to be a lot of people who don't survive the test. But, again, misumoel, this is the will of God. This, this document, by the way, is written in Arabic. It is, it's, it's written Belashon Kedar. Why is it written in Belashon Kedar? Because Rambam wanted every illiterate person to be able to hear it, not in the Hebrew, but in the lingua franca, in what they spoke probably Judeo-Arabic, so that you could, you got a copy of the letter and you read it in shul, you read it in your, at your family uh, Shabbat afternoon, and that everybody would, would understand this, that he was saying, yeah, things are tough, but they are chevle Mashiach, they are the birth pangs of Mashiach, we will survive this. And the Rambam then continues and he says, of the following, he says, don't try to calculate the arrival of Mashiach. Moshe only came when the Jews gave up hope. So to the Mashiach's coming, you don't know when it is, stop calculating Mashiach. And by the way, if you look in the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, the Rambam will also say that the that you you do not gain the love of God nor the fear of God from the study of the times of Mashiach. Abandon that practice. And then he also says that the Messiah in Yemen is certainly a fraud. But what you have to understand here is that the Rambam emerges not just as a great lawgiver. The Rambam is here the great cheerleader of the Jewish people coming out of this intense period of Muslim oppression, these sort of um, um, intolerant Muslims, and the Jews begin to breathe, breathe a sigh of fresh air. Even though Saladin is very particular about the laws of what animals Jews are allowed to ride, 
Saladin still leaves the Jews room to actually practice their, their Judaism. He's certainly better than the Almohades. And Saladin then represents a, this, this moment of great vision for the Jewish people, this opening that, that m- may bring about this vision where Jews can actually return to Jerusalem. Maybe the Rambam's Mishneh Torah is a prep, preparation for that. You should just know, by the way, that um, I think Mayor Barilan did something similar. He wrote, um, he wrote a set of halachot, which would be sort of like a civil code for, for the Jewish nation. It's a fascinating exercise because you, you know that, that the state of Israel does not operate by, by Jewish law, but it has sort of a mix of a little bit of Jewish law, but Ottoman and British law mostly govern the country. And the Rambam was, in, was really envisioning, he's a very forward thinker in terms of, of how to organize. Every code that happens after really begins its thought process with Maimonides. That will be a, a different period of time. We'll have to discuss that. But I guess today's takeaways are that um, Rambam and Saladin are intertwined both personally and also intellectually. It is under the 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 watchful the the relatively peaceful reign of Saladin that Rambam is able to become the great leader that he is. He's able to to imbue the ph- philosophy that he gets from Alexandria. That he then, if you read the Mishneh Torah, if you read the Mor Nevuchim, you will understand that that the Rambam is not the Rambam without exposure to that, and that the you also see that that the Rambam, under this period of time, becomes the great, um, the, the great emotional support. We think of Rambam as a great lawgiver, but one of the things I think this exploration has taught us is that Rambam was also this great emotional support for the Jewish people who had been through this very intense persecution and were either flirting with, with dangerous messianism or were had suffered themselves a sort of their own Murano kind of a thing where they took on the apostasy of 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 the the Almohades required of this declaration of that Muhammad was their prophet, but Maimonides is the one who gives them license and and encouragement to leave those areas and to return to their full throated uh, Judaism. Hello. Right. So. Hello. Okay. Um, so we are. Um, I guess I can take a quick question. I should be running off to Minchamar, but. Uh, Questions. Are you able to share thoughts. that uh, video with us, Rabbi? What's that? Can you send us a link to that video that you wanted us to watch? All right, here, I'll show you that video now, and you'll realize why I didn't go crazy showing it to you. Well, well don't, don't wait. Don't, if you have to leave, don't, don't delay yourself. So. Here. It's really just, you can see the, uh, the crusaders, you know, dying of thirst. It's really the, uh, (laughs) what to remember from that. Uh, so here, when this guy falls off his horse, you'll appreciate exactly. That is how Saladin won the battle. Is that a coincidence that, that the Jews in Spain followed Rambam's uh, directive as to try to uh, kind of convert on the outside to Christianity, but in, in the house and in, in secrecy continue practicing Judaism? Being uh, good question. Was... I feel uh, not yet read into that question. So stay tuned, maybe at a future installment. But you love teaching us so much. You. Uh... It's hard for you to end uh, in time with it. Thank you for what a what a great class. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. Thanks. Thank you.